Therapists, what was the moment you realized your client couldn't be helped? I'm not a therapist, but I am a qualified counselor who worked with traumatized young people in a residential home. Essentially, my team and I were surrogate parents for these kids, each spending between one and three, sometimes five nights a week at the house. Before the case that broke me, I had experienced a lot of different behaviors explicit behaviors, violent outbursts, reactive attachment. I'd worked with kids who'd burnt down houses, solicited themselves, used intravenous substances, ended family pets, attempted to end siblings, etc. I thought I'd seen enough to become callous to it all. I was at work with two young people I absolutely adored. They called me uncle, a term of respect and endearment in indigenous Australians. When I got a call at 9.30 p.m. at night asking me to relieve a shift the next morning with an intense case. I accepted it because before this kid, I thought I was Superman and could handle anything. I arrived at 6 a.m. and got a handover and a heads up from the workers on shift. They warned me this kid was violent, but as far as I knew, it wasn't anything I hadn't seen before. There's an expression, eyes are the window to the soul. When you looked into the eyes of this child, there was a darkness unlike anything I'd seen before or likely will see again. It was obvious that the evils this child had endured had destroyed their soul. This child attempted to proposition me for explicit favors as soon as we were alone. When I tried to redirect the conversation to appropriate methods of expressing gratitude, this child shifted. They took a pencil out from under the desk and charged full pelt screaming, You're a stupid kitty fiddler. You're just like the rest of them. Don't having touch me, etc. This child proceeded to attack me multiple times before the other worker was able to subdue them. The same child was on a very unique child safety order. The terms of the order were a direct contradiction of the legislation and had to be signed by the state manager. This child was to be kept on site unless medically necessary due to the danger to themselves and the community. Once the escalation settled and the nighttime routine began, the child asked me for more soap. This had to be given in small containers at a time to avoid the child creating slip traps for workers. As I approached with the soap, the child had peeled off the mirror of the bathroom wall and smashed it over my head before lunging at me with a shard. I managed to catch their wrist and disarm them while my co-worker secured the debris. The child then swallowed a piece of glass and smirked at my co-worker and I, knowing we'd have to take them to the hospital. Once at the hospital, the child ran away before even entering triage. This is where it gets interesting. In her safety plan, there were 25 possible addresses the child frequented. A common behavior of the child was to exchange favors for ice, so the houses we had to search for were filled with less than desirable folks. I received a call from the police to say they'd located her at a nearby service station. Upon arriving, the child had doused themselves with fuel and threatened to light herself and the whole place on fire. She ran away again but wasn't seen or heard from for the rest of the night. That was my first shift with a child that had put 42 other workers on work cover. I worked with them for another 8 weeks before throwing in the towel. I had a mental breakdown and began drinking heavily for the first time in 10 years. I had begun taking prescription medication for the pain. This kid broke two teeth and threw my back out. And for the mental anguish, I was never the same happy-go-lucky optimist again. Knowing the best solution for a child is a quick and painless death was not easy for my psyche to handle. The longer I worked with the child, the more I learned about them. They were born into a kitty fiddler ring. Their mother was the product of unspeakable evil since childhood and simply continued the cycle. That was five years ago, and since I've had to leave the industry, I no longer drink, but I am filled with pessimism. I refuse to have children because of that child. The fact that some kids can't be saved scares me out of risking having my own. I still have nightmares about this kid. I don't know if any of this makes any sense, but please let me know if any parts are confusing. Story 2 Some of these responses I doubt are coming from therapists, so I will try to answer as clearly as I can. The first answer is, quote, if they clearly don't want to help themselves, therapists can guide you, provide a useful and objective outside perspective, help you reframe your experiences, and can provide tools to help you direct your energy and thoughts. But we cannot do anything for you. 
We cannot start or end relationships for you. We cannot make you take your medication or force you to cease any of your destructive habits or practice new beneficial habits. Those are your decisions and I cannot make any of them for you, even when to me the consequences of those decisions are clear. The second answer is, quote, when I'm not the right therapist for this client. There are many reasons why I may not be the right therapist. I have my own style of communication, my own values, and my own personality. And those may not work with a certain client. I have had little success with certain clients who I have sent to other therapists, and they have done well. Similarly, I have taken on clients who were frustrated with their past therapists, and I have worked well with them. The last answer is, quote, when the client's pathology requires intense or medical intervention. Therapy cannot substitute for inpatient care when that is needed, and therapists cannot prescribe medication even when that would help. Unfortunately, inpatient care is always in short supply, and many clients resist that idea, and you often have to advise them that they cannot see you until they complete an inpatient course of treatment. I have to be very clear here. The dramatic statement, quote, a therapist said I was too messed up to be helped, is often what clients hear, frequently because it advances their specific narrative, when we always try to help, even if it means asking them to see another therapist or pursue another course of treatment. The analogy I use is that most mechanics can work on most cars, but if you have an unusual foreign car, you'll probably get better results finding a mechanic with more experience working on that brand. I cannot help you is not the same as you cannot be helped. I think it's safe to say that, yeah, anyone can help you to a certain degree, but it all boils down to helping yourself. Story 3. One month in with this couple, a wife had just spent five minutes explaining the impact of her husband's language on her and how devalued, disregarded, and unimportant she felt in the relationship. His response to her was to, verbatim, use the exact language she had just described to respond to her. She collapsed into sobs and he sat back, sighed, rolled his eyes, and gestured vaguely to her as if I would agree that she's the problem. I told him exactly the opposite. He storms out. She went to the lawyer I recommended and cleaned him out. Full custody too. It was truly a happy ending. Emotional cruelty is still a folks. When people endorse cruelty in an intake session, we do not proceed. If they endorse later, we do not proceed. If I have my suspicions, but there isn't an endorsement or any concrete evidence, I take the opportunity to build evidence to label it and build rapport with the victim to eventually educate them and provide them with the resources they need to exit safely if they want to leave. The struggle with emotional and or psychological torture as opposed to physical is that victims of emotional are far more often in denial. They often cannot label the behaviors accurately because after months or years of being gaslit, they no longer trust their recollection. Because no one is being hit, a client must understand what emotional cruelty is to identify it as a This doesn't always happen, especially when we take into consideration the impact of culture and socioeconomic status on a person's social expectations. What is intolerable to some is the status quo for others. As therapists, we live in the in-between. Furthermore, many people that present with emotional cruel behaviors are often functioning in fight-flight-freeze as the result of their own trauma. The vast majority of intermittently cruel <laughs> can and do change with the appropriate support and boundaries during session. I've seen it, I've lived it, and it's beautiful. When the attempt to educate and set boundaries fails horribly, we do not proceed, which is exactly what happened here. The client, storming out and leaving, only beat me to it. Another session would not have been scheduled regardless. The point is, it's easy to say therapy never works for cruel relationships, but how this boundary is actually executed and when it's drawn is an entirely different story. Story 4 I'm not a therapist, but I have volunteered in a mental health cafe with qualified counselors. We often, volunteers included, had training from the NHS on self-harm, and we would have meetings with people high up in the mental health field for better insight on how we could assist these people. The mental health cafe in part was made to actually give people a place to turn to in crisis without needing to be sent to a mental health hospital. If the ambulance service got a call for a mental health crisis, 
They would take the patient to us instead of A&E. I was volunteering there because I myself was extremely unwell mentally and thought it could help me. What I learned in those meetings with the experts, I'll never forget. Most patients they speak to can't be saved and they weren't expecting us to believe we could either. We needed to abandon that thought, otherwise it would crush us. Keeping a patient alive isn't perceived as saving them. Most of the time, we just encourage them away from ending themselves because they are a ticking time bomb for mental health. If they die, their family inherits their pain and trauma instead. An hour of conversation every few days away from their family wasn't going to help them. It was just a metaphorical way of giving them oxygen. Only the patient could ultimately save themselves, and oftentimes they were too far beneath the water to reach anyone. I stopped volunteering there shortly after that. They were so casually talking about my situation without realizing it. My mental health has improved greatly since, but it's definitely declining again. This thread has made me realize I need to reach out to people again. I never want to go back to that headspace. The amount of stress these people get is beyond my comprehension. I'm really thankful for the people who take on tasks like this to help other people out. I actually try to do my part in making people happy by creating these videos that would hopefully make you laugh or brighten up your day. And I hope one way or another my videos help you out. So if you've been affected by my work in a positive way, I would appreciate it if you do hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. It's very inspiring and also helpful when people like you do. Let's go ahead and get back to the stories. Story five. I'm here a little late, but the question assumes that some people are just entirely beyond help, which isn't accurate. I'm a marriage and family therapist and have seen a wide range of clients. Some clients have problems that require medication. You refer them to a psychiatrist for that and then continue the therapy. You also have clients that are court mandated and don't want to be there, which limits what you can do and largely depends on them to actually do the work in order to complete therapy. With problem teens, this is even harder, and some of them would rather run away than finish their sessions. But in each of these scenarios, you still do the best you possibly can and try to be as helpful as possible. You have to think of your therapist like a personal trainer. We know what needs to be done, and we can talk you through it. But ultimately, you are the one lifting the weights. If you refuse to exercise, that's on you. But even the most difficult clients can still be helped. A great therapist shouldn't have to give up on anyone as long as they are showing up and always willing to try. I will say that every therapist eventually gets a client that is stuck in a cycle that they cannot ever seem to break. These people stay in therapy forever, and while they improve, they never complete therapy. You just go through the motions with them and keep trying until something clicks. Sometimes people just need someone that can help them process life. Other times, you have someone suffering from something they can never get over, like the loss of a spouse or child, and you just help them deal with the day to day. So few people have friends or family that will just listen and let a person talk without making it all about them. People need someone that can show empathy and compassion for their suffering, even if there isn't a clear finish line at the end. Story six, secret account here. I worked for a rehab and heard this from a guy I listened to when talking about recovery. There are typically three kinds of people who are all but destined to fail or are incapable of adherence to recovery unless revolution happens in their mind: those who are too smart, those who are too rich, and those who are too young. The too smarts are the classic pessimistic overthinking type who nitpick at every suggestion, overcomplicate simple notions. Twist words and attempts to find loopholes or contradictions that prove that they are smarter than the program, and therefore do not need the program because they can see through it or are simply ramble rousing to deflect themselves from self-discovery. The two rich people are just that; they are incredibly wealthy and connected, and often these two attributes provide a pillow fort for them to dive deeper into their. <laughs> they don't get DUIs because they always have cab fare or a driver for themselves. They never run out of because they have deep pockets or no friendly doctors from some social affair. They don't get in serious legal troubles because they have the purse and know who to have expert legal counsel. Their inability to witness the actions so many of us fall down leaves them with the inability to see the desperate situation they are painted in because there is always something that prevents the next stumble along the road. The two young ones are just that. They are youthful. They see themselves in the summer of their life. 
trying the world on for size and still full of that invulnerability that is so often running through their veins. They figure that they have the rest of their lives to get it together, and youth is fleeting, and maybe after a few more years of this, they can stop, no problem, unaware that the depths of is what happens with the pink cloud pops. All of these are incredibly hard to work with, hard to show a new way, and I have often watched ones who fit all three of these leave, only to next see them in the obituary, or the article where luck ran out and the next few years will be in a small cell. Story 7. I'm a therapist for individuals with severe and persistent mental illness as part of a team that does a lot of mobile and intensive services. As a result, I've worked with a lot of people for years that I've realized I can't really help much with my skill set. Most commonly, this is folks who are elderly and start experiencing a lot of cognitive decline. I eventually really don't do much beyond giving them some socialization and more case management to get them appropriate services. Therapeutically, I'm not doing much to help them. Eventually, they go to a nursing home with a dementia unit and I never see them again. The other scenario is when people is actively invested against therapy, for example, court-mandated, when legal guardians are forcing therapy, or when payee services refuse to contact their clients except through us, the county forces clients on us. In those cases, I try to build common ground, develop as much rapport as possible, and meet them where they're at, and be as radically open as I can. Unfortunately, in some cases, there's just so much grievances between us to be able to help them, which doesn't help when it's mandatory and insurance won't allow a switch, yay, managed care. It's not so much that they can't be helped, it's just that I or my team can't help them because of all these environmental factors interfering. I've dealt with a lot of serious cases, significant psychosis and or personality disorders, etc., and I don't think I've ever met anyone that I felt was truly beyond any sort of help from anybody. Just a lot of cases of I'm not the right person in the right environment. Story 8. I'm not a therapist, but as my squadron's first sergeant, I counseled a fair number of airmen. The one I'll never forget was a new arrival at the unit. 19 years old, he'd enlisted on the advice of his parents, both career active duty and COs. He came to my squadron following tech training and was starting work in his new job. On his third visit to my office for the same infraction, showing up late for work, I spent the better part of an hour trying to get to the bottom of his issue. At one point, he told me, Sergeant disinterested, bad things just happened to me. That's when I knew there was nothing I could do to help him. Less than a week later, he was late again and my commander decided to offer punishment under Article 15 as a last resort to get the lad's attention. Get this. The doofus showed up late for the meeting at which he was supposed to receive punishment for repeatedly being late to work. Sadly, this was the only consistency he demonstrated during his brief stint in military service. It was at this point the commander decided to begin discharge proceedings on the grounds the guy was clearly unfit for the military. Why this wasn't determined during basic training or at his tech training squadron is another story. The commander warned the youth the process would take a couple of weeks and that if he showed up late to work again before the discharge was complete, it would mean time in the brig. He was discharged two weeks later after spending three days in the brig. Can you guess why? He had diarrhea and exploded in the mess hall, and thus he was late? That could be a legitimate excuse. Story 9. As a patient, I can tell you I was speaking from the lowest depth of my heart about my issues with living socially and dominated by social anxiety and all my worries about more pervasive issues like disabilities, etc. And we spoke for a while, and I learned some things, but when I wanted to talk about things in the past that I ruminate on, and moments where certain people hurt me by being belligerent due to some of these issues, I just remember there was a pause and a, I see, and then just this prolonged pause where it felt like she wasn't sure what to do next. And then she would tell me, you can't dwell on the past since you can't change it, but it wasn't what I needed to hear. She was right, of course, but I don't know. I needed to figure out how to deal with that thing I was told by someone and how to avoid ever being told something like that. It was an incident where I was socially anxious and mute at a table with 20 classmates on a tour somewhere, and the guy in front of me yelled, you're always so freaking awkward, dude. And then the rest of the trip, it felt like everyone was avoiding me like I was contagious. It was not the first humiliation either, but I was just so disappointed that she couldn't say anything more than, don't dwell on the past. 
Anyway, I wasn't dropped, but I kind of just stopped showing up and then I stopped being signed up for it. She was trying to give me her methods, but I think I just needed someone to talk to. Story 10. On the flip side, I've just had about nothing but horrible experiences trying to get care for myself and after guinea-pigging through so many meds and realizing that inpatient care, in my experience, is an absolute nightmare and is much more likely to give you additional trauma rather than benefit you in any way, I've given up on most of my country's options for getting mentally better. However, I am starting therapy again to have someone to confer my day-to-day thoughts and ideologies with, but nothing else. Instead, I've started taking medication and proper sleep very seriously, exercising more, staying hydrated, trying to eat healthier, practicing positive affirmations and thinking about what I'm grateful for every morning and night, staying busy when I can, not using any substance when I'm in a bad way, grass is for good moods to make me more giggly, but not as a pacifier when I'm having a low moment, and being as loving and compassionate to the people around me and people I meet as possible. Inpatient care and medication works for many people. Don't take this comment as condemning. Some people simply just need to be on medication as well. I am very fortunate and grateful for how I am able to be determined to better myself, and I recognize I was truly getting worse every time I sought treatment from any facility or professional in general. Different things, I guess, work for different people. Take care of yourself, y'all. Life's too short to be your own worst enemy. This is so true. Enjoy life, everyone. There's always so much more to live for. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you made it this far, I'm sure you're also going to enjoy Therapists. What was your I know I'm not supposed to judge you, but holy crap story? The therapist in Story 2 almost left his career. I'll see you in that video, and thank you for watching this one.